from the training side, I think saying it most simply would probably be just the idea of how important it is to create an adaptive signal versus, you know, putting myself into survival mode. That Triathlon Show 205. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Amber Nieben and Tim Cusick. Amber is one of the most accomplished cyclists in the history of women's cycling, with, uh, among other things, on her CV, two individual world championship titles, and uh, just recently finishing fourth at the world championships in Yorkshire, at the age of 44. So she joins us for this discussion together with her coach Tim Cusick, who you've heard a couple of times before on this podcast, and we will discuss a lot of things, but mostly related to Amber's training and uh, how, what training they did leading up to the World Championships, but from the bigger picture as well, how she has been training over the years to have uh, such great success over time and great longevity as well and continued success at uh, the age of 44. Before we get into the interview, a big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And many of you will already be back in the full swing of, swing of things with your base training and are moving indoors due to uh, short days and uh, cooler weather conditions. So the trainer will probably be in use a lot, maybe even the treadmill. And that generally means a lot of sweating. So if you want to make sure that you preserve performance, especially if you do longer and harder workouts on the indoor trainer or on the treadmill, then it's worth taking some time to think about your, your hydration during those workouts. And for example, if you tend to get very sweaty, you get sweat marks on your body or on your uh, training gear or clothes, then that might be an indication that you're losing a lot of electrolytes and should replace them. And Precision Hydration can help with that. You just go to their website, precisionhydration.com, and choose the free hydration plan. And that will help you estimate how much electrolytes, if any, you need to consume during training and racing. If you want to try your first box or tube of electrolyte for free, use the promo code DEATHTRAFFLONSHOW, all one word, all caps. And a big thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. They are the leading manufacturers of wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, and high-performance eyewear. And one pretty cool thing that uh, I've mentioned a couple of times before is in their goggles, the R1 goggles. They have uh, the lenses angled so that you can basically lift your head a lot less than with uh, most other goggles and still get a good sighting in and see where you're going. So in the open water of your races, that's uh, a massive benefit, I find. And... uh, one thing that is pretty fun to do now in the base training phase is to actually practice that in the pool. And you can even compare using those goggles with uh, using some other goggles that don't have that same angling. And swim, for example, with five one hundreds with each pair of goggles at the same perceived effort level and with the same number of sightings per 100. And uh, compare how much quicker you actually go if you don't need to maybe maybe lose as much momentum as you might do if you lift your head a bit more to sight with the goggles that don't have that same angling. A cool experiment that uh, might be fun to try out. And whether it's goggles, tri suits, wetsuits or anything else on the Roka website that you're looking for, you can get 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS, all caps, on roka.com. Without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Amber Nieben and Tim Cusick. Today's guests on that triathlon show is uh, a coach and an athlete. We have uh, Amber Nieben and Tim Cusick. You've heard Tim Cusick before, obviously, but uh, Amber, you're new to the podcast. So welcome to you and welcome to Tim. And uh, Amber, we want to hear a bit more about you, your uh, background and, uh, and your recent results, especially, but all, all your career results that, uh, that listeners might be interested in hearing. Yeah, I'll take you briefly through everything. Um, I started as a soccer player, moved into distance running, uh, and eventually got into cycling, which has been my career for the last 20-ish years. Um, I've raced all over the world. I think I've probably competed in 27 different countries. 
I've been able to compete in 15 world championships, um, winning three of them, two individually and one in the team time trial. I've raced uh, tons of the stage races and individual races, um, Pan Am championships, national championships, uh, all all different kinds of races all through the 20 years. Uh, my background in education or with education is I have a BS in biology from the University of Nebraska, and I have a MS in physiology and biophysics from the University of California, Irvine. I also coach uh, and I have a PN precision nutrition um, certification. So that's kind of my background. Um, after a really bad crash in 2013 that really reset my career and started the second half of my career, I wrote a book, When Schmack Happens. So that's probably the most interesting part of my life. Um, but that's, I don't know, any anything specific you want to touch on there? What what specific cycling disciplines uh, are you are your main disciplines? You said that you raced all, all sorts of races, but, but yeah. what are the, the main ones for you? I started in mountain biking, but I quickly moved over to the roadside. So road racing has been my focus and I am specifically a time trial specialist. Uh, in, the, in the beginning and middle part of my career, I was also a pretty good climber. So I would focus a lot on that, which really helped my time trialing. But now I'm, I'm pretty focused on time trialing. Got it. And uh, when did you start working with, uh, with Tim and, uh, and how has that coaching relationship developed over time? Yeah, that was back in 2014, uh, the end of 2014. Uh, we were both working a cycling camp and we had a conversation at camp and he started at the time I had uh, been coaching myself um, in recovery from that crash I mentioned. And I had 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 a really good conversation with him and he had offered to be a consultant to me and I agreed and allowed him to come on board. And, you know, honestly, I have to say if I, if we never met, I wouldn't be where I am. So it's been such a blessing to have him a part of this journey, but initially it started with him being a consultant and then we built trust. I think a big thing about athlete coach relationships is just, you know, you have to build trust. You have to be able to communicate and we built the trust. We learned how to listen. He listened really well. And I eventually just handed everything over to him. And we've had a good back and forth um, along the way. And I think early in time, you know, there was a lot of science and strict science. But as I've aged a little bit, you know, it shifted more to strategy. Um, so that communication that we have has allowed him to be a really good artist with me. Um, and my nuances of training and things that we, we've had to deal with along the way. And uh, for context, uh, you are now how old exactly? Because that's actually how this interview came about. Tim contacted me after you raced in the World Championships in, in Yorkshire. So so how old are you and what did you? how did you do in Yorkshire? Yeah, so I am 44 years old um, and I was fourth place in Yorkshire, which was our world championships that's very impressive and for somebody like me i don't follow the cycling uh, uh, cycling world that closely I, I mean i follow the tour and the uh, wealth and the giro and, but uh, and i did follow yorkshire a little bit but not very much how how surprising is that to at 44 years old uh, be that uh, that high up in the in the rankings at the world championship level yeah, I haven't looked, so I don't know for sure, but I don't remember anybody older being that high. I know Jeannie Longo had some results. Uh, Kristen was in her 40s when she won her gold, but it's it's very unique. And honestly, it was it was kind of cool because Chloe, who won, was half my age. So I certainly am competing against people who are half my age easily. Yeah. And, and we'll definitely get into that a little bit more, how you manage the, and how things have changed, uh, changed since your twenties and thirties. But uh, before that, a little bit more about Yorkshire. What was that your main goal for the season to perform well there? And, and what did you, uh, what specific goals and expectations, if any, did you have? Yeah, it was my main goal um, with the caveat of saying that I had to qualify first. So it wasn't, automatic that I was going to be selected. So within having that main goal of the world championships, I had to qualify. So that was, that was done through the national championships. Um, and yeah, my goal, my goal is always to win. Um, I, 
I have no fear of saying that. Um, my expectation was to podium. So I think for me in Yorkshire, you know, fourth place is always a hard place to be. Um, we call that the wood medal. And it's <laughs> you're one you're one spot off the podium. So it's it's a hard place to be. But at the same time for me, knowing um obviously my age, but honestly, I had a mechanical in the last three Ks of the race and I was dealing with vertigo, really, really bad vertigo, or we made a hospital visit the day before. So, you know, I was pretty excited to be able to pull off fourth place. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like some, uh, some circumstances that made it even more uh, challenging to, to be on the podium, let, well, to be on a fourth place, but let alone a podium. So let's talk about the, the training and uh, and the season and and how it went how you built up to uh, to have that good race in in Yorkshire and uh, maybe this is where we we call on on Tim to to add some com- contributions to the conversation how did you plan the the season in terms of training and racing to be qualified and be ready to perform in Yorkshire sure uh glad to answer so you really have to go back to the bigger picture you know as you Two were just speaking about Yorkshire. Yorkshire was just one step in the plan. So even when you start saying a year, understand in performing at Amber's level where, you know, you have a multi-time Olympian, you got to, you know, we're always looking at the bigger picture, bigger plan. The bigger picture, it was, we want to qualify for the Olympics. So the reason that's important to say is that forces you, and I think for the listeners, this is more important than they might imagine. Um, don't think in one year cycles. We were actually, we're always thinking in three to four year cycles. Well, you know, the reality is the Olympics being every four years kind of drives that. And the everyday cyclist might say, well, it's not really that important for me to think like that, but it is. If you take a new cyclist, you take anybody training over time, if you can think bigger picture like that, you can often produce better results because you you can break down the view into acute and chronic and think about it in the sense that your your season is one step towards achieving something bigger. A lot of young riders are impatient, right? They want it all this year <laughs> and that can get them into training trouble and stuff like that. So with Amber, when you look at the season planning of the year, um, we really had the main goal was we looked at what it took to qualify for the Olympics. We spent some time at the Olympic Training Center. Uh, sat down, decided, you know, we were going to really work towards making the Olympic team. You then take a look at the criteria and say, well, what do we need to achieve that's crucial to the criteria? And that's a game changer. I mean, oftentimes you have athletes that have to run and race full seasons and, and you know, participate, you know, uh, in more activity for their team. Amber, at this point in her career and her success, has a luxury of being a little more in control of her schedule. So basically what we knew with the criteria, you know, last season was so important because the Olympic selections will be in June of 2019, pre-nationals, to, or some 2020, pre the nationals, we had to meet all the criteria this year. That means we looked at, you know, three core events, Pan Am to nationals to worlds. We had to, you know, do well at Pan Ams and 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 or win nationals to qualify, make sure we were in the world championships. So that obviously became the core of our planning. Um, we then needed to do some road racing and some, uh, you know, other alternative race, you know, other races to ensure that, you know, we're bringing in a well-rounded resume into the Olympic selection process. So we chose local to Amber Redlands because it takes a little travel stress off her um, and to do well at the tour of California. Um, and that basically was the outline of our season schedule. My typical approach as those who know me, and you and I have actually talked about this before, it really is just I break things down into a two-phase sort of periodized plan. Um, you know, for me, phase one really is all about that kind of uh, – training, training foundation, kind of, it's a phase of training that I call your training to train, right? And that's more of your kind of base phase and other stuff. I think one of the things that when you start to think about, um, you know, the way we approach the year, and this, we'll get into this, I think a little bit later more, but uh, Amber does a fair amount of training, meaning she does and handles at 44, actually a pretty high training load. 
But the reality is when you're looking at the big picture multiple years, we don't want to raise that training load very high all four years in a row and still expect to peak and win an Olympics. We've actually over the last like three years ago was her lowest training load, her lowest CTL probably of her career um, outside of an injury year. And then the reality is we've been building each year back a little higher so that we're introducing more tr- more training load, we're building more training resiliency, we're building more fitness and capability, which we're going to hopefully translate into performance. And now we're on that higher load trajectory. We began to build that early this year. That will actually carry us into the Olympics if we make the team. So we did a little more of that that training phase, that base training, maybe to give it a name. I wouldn't, I don't like the word base, maybe more of that foundation training. So most of the first half of the year leading up to nationals, we didn't really do any, what I, my phase two training, which is performance training, really driving a peak. We knew we didn't want to peak too early and we knew we needed to extend it to worlds or at least re-peak by worlds. So we focus more early season this year more so than the last two years in the cycle, on building base fitness, um, lifting threshold from below, pushing up more of a, of a lactate tolerance and, and those types of approaches. It really was only a couple of weeks before nationals did we flip the performance switch on, start doing some high-intensity training load um, and really sharpening uh, for Amber. The effect, and I see this all the time, of really building that deeper foundation what, where I knew Amber was going to do well at nationals was she was handling more high-intensity training. So a very simple example I see with athletes, if their their foundation training is poor and they go and they're doing, let's say, five-minute intervals, you know, they're, they're attempting to do something that raises VO2 max, they might be only able to do 20 minutes or you know, four times five or maybe five times five. If their foundation training is really strong, they can do more. They can do that sixth interval or maybe that seventh interval. And if they can do that well and absorb that effort, that stress and strain, then they actually respond better and peak. So our foundation phase led us into our performance phase. Uh, Amber was knocking out really good depth of work, a lot of time and zone work in that performance phase, even though the window was only a couple of weeks. So I knew she was on form. She went to Gatineau. She won Gatineau UCI 1.1 and crushed it. I mean, she was super fast. As a matter of fact, I have to admit right here to Amber, I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, we peaked a little early. (laughs) But the reality is she was on the same form at nationals and crushed nationals. So we immediately shut down. At her age, one of the things is we have to preserve. We don't peak as long. It just is what it is. We can't sustain you know, that, that long extended peak like she used to be able to. We shut down. We took a good rest. And then we actually did an abbreviated foundation and a slightly longer performance phase leading into Worlds. Worlds was a longer course and a little bit tougher. It was going to take a little bit more fatigue resistance and resiliency out there on the course. So we shifted our training more to a little bit more of a strength and power type of focus. Amber actually did a fair amount of climbing in preparation for Worlds. So... uh, you know, once she got into that performance phase, but again, was on form. I think that it worked really well. She's, uh, she's not going to say it, but I'll kind of say it. The, the week before we did, we usually don't taper extensively. It's just not best for Amber. She needs a little training load to perform well. So we usually do our last hard workout about two weeks out, uh, 10 days out. We were up on the loft house climb, which was on the women's road race. And Amber was crushing it. Numbers were good and strong, really on form. You know, we ran into a little bad luck with some sickness, as, as she kind of stated, and and some issues. That happens. That's racing. Welcome to the world of it. But um, we felt that the process was pretty solid. We we might have peaked a, a couple of days early there, but the reality is we were able to bring it about a second time. So basically, you had first part of this season, extended foundation, short performance phase, into rest, then a short foundation phase, longer performance phase into world championships. And for those that haven't heard you talk about the foundation phase and the performance phase, can you give a, an overview of what type of training you do in, in each of those phases and uh, how, and also if there are any changes in, in things like volume uh, in between those phases? 
Yeah. So the foundation phase to me, I'm a little bit old school. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm known as using data and stuff like that. And it's uh, some, a lot of times we, we get all this data uh, connected to, that means, you know, a lot less training, a lot more results. And the reality is it, it doesn't work like that. You know, Amber trains a pretty high volume. So in the foundation phase, we are, you know, we're doing a lot of what you would kind of call base training. So we're doing high volume, high duration rides, let's call it. So high volume, high duration, there's a fair amount of that. She's training, you know, somewhere between 20 and 25 hours a week, not to, to give it away too much. We do use a combination of, I am that kind of zone three trainer, you know, the pyramid versus the polarized approach. During that foundation phase, I use a more pyramid style approach. So we're doing a fair amount of time doing tempo and sweet spot work. We're pushing threshold up from below. We're dealing with some, how we handle lactate and how the system works, how we make energy a lot. So a lot of that is our focus in that phase. But the main thing we're doing in that phase is we're progressing. And, you know, with Amber particularly, and I know, one, she's such an amazing athlete and she's such a specimen to work with because she can do whatever I say. I mean, I could literally potentially kill her with training. <laughs> if I prescribed enough, she would probably be able to do it. Um, but the reality is what's so crucial, and, and, and you would think this would change a little bit as she aged, but it's actually not. It's become more important. We have to maintain progression. As soon as we stop progressing load with her in this phase, in that, in the training phase, in the foundation phase, she'll stagnate really quickly and we'll actually fall backwards in fitness. So it's super important that our strategy where we have a lot of flexibility in it with her because we listen to our body really well. One principle that we really stick to is we're Andy Coggin used to say, uh, A, B, P, always be pushing right? So we're always stepping up the progression, but probably 90% of the work is what we would classically refer to as aerobic. Now, once we flip the switch into performance, we're doing exactly what you would think. Volume comes down to a degree, um, intensity goes up, and we do actually flip more to a polarized format um, during that time period. So we'll still get some longer endurance rides in. We pull down the endurance intensity a little bit, um, during the, the, once we make the flip into the performance phase, we're doing two to three, what we would call hard workouts a week. So a little higher than the classic 80, 20 model, but at Amber's level of efficiency and, and 20 years of adaptation, it takes a, a higher stress and strain load to produce response. And she recovers really well and still has energy to adapt so we can get away with it. But in those two to three hard days, we're typically doing what I would refer to as two high intensity workouts and one speed kind of workout where there's a slight difference in how we're, you know, uh, translating that into the physiological response. Um, that being said, that's our pattern. But in the performance phase is where Amber and I work very hard in our communication about her fatigue and how she communicates that to me and how I respond to it. Because that's, you know, obviously one of the big challenge of the maturing athlete that you can quickly go too far as soon as you move into that intensity zone. So you got to be attentive to it. So that's pretty much how the two phases works and some good overview of what we put in. This is really interesting that you mentioned there towards the end, uh, the thing about fatigue. Actually, just a couple of days ago, I did an, an episode about fatigue, uh, discussing, discussing with, uh, with uh, my uh, fellow coaches, James Teagle and uh, Lothan Kirin. So, Amber, how do you, uh, I guess, uh, communicate fatigue and uh, measure fatigue if you do it with objective measures? And, and how does that impact what you do in training? Yeah, it's actually really hard to communicate that. Um, there's really no objective way to measure it. So I've just had to learn over, you know, the course of 20 years of training really to read my body and often learning those lessons has come by making mistakes um, and pushing too hard through it. Um, the biggest, I think the biggest trick is learning how to figure out what are those days where, you know, you're tired, you don't feel good, but you need to push through it versus those days where you go out and you just need to pull the plug and go home, which I think is really hard to do as an athlete. Um, so learning how to just, it's more of a sense 
really than anything objective. And it's come from making mistakes on both directions. So now when I try to communicate it to Tim, I just, I mean, I guess probably try to communicate how I'm making the power, you know, am I straining to make it? Am I on it? Um, am I fighting for it? Really? Those are probably the biggest cues. Um, you know, my sleeping and some of the rest and digest from the parasympathetic also kind of give me a, a clue. And sometimes you just like your brain gets tired and you just, you have that, um, lack of motivation, I guess you could say, but it's different than just being tired and, and not needing to fight through, mm. um, I don't know if that's useful or not, but yeah, you know. it's very much being in tune with your with your body. It sounds like so. Uh, so it is yeah. it is very useful for because it it does tell us that well that's um, an attribute that we we need to have as endurance athletes. Uh, yeah, and I think talking it out with Tim is very helpful. You know, if if you're when I talk things out with athletes, I coach to try to help them learn how to communicate that back to me. Um, there's the, the back and forth where when he writes a workout, he has to be able to communicate in a way that I can translate it to my legs and then vice versa. You know, I do a workout and I have to be able to communicate back to him in a way that he can understand. So there's give and take with that. And we, we've learned through the years how to do it. It hasn't been, you know, a light switch to be able to figure it out in one day. It's just been process. Yeah. And uh, we got a description there of your uh, your season and uh, and the whole the big picture planning behind it as well. Can you describe how your training and even racing potentially has uh, changed over time since your early days of of racing? And obviously, not going into like super great detail of every single change that has been made, but uh, as a big picture overview, uh, how different is this from what you have been doing? in the past and, and what have you doing differently and uh, why have you changed things up go go into that a little bit yeah i think because my career has been so long i think the easiest way to really talk about it would be to look back to 2013 in that crash and move forward from there and think of the second phase of my career um and i think there were a couple different things that needed to change um physically i had some issues so my glutes had stopped firing or weren't working optimally. And I was having gut issues, which weren't helping with recovery and fueling on the bike. Um, and then from a training perspective, I was really stagnant. I'd been doing the same thing for a long period of time. So working on the, the training stagnation and really understanding that, um, in addition, you know, just the idea of timing peaks, right. Um, and, and coming into the right races on point, um, figuring all that out has been a huge driver, um, since 2013, um, in my training, I would say some of the things that I've learned to do differently and some of it has really just been maturity, but also in working with Tim, but the idea of not trying to set a world record every time I'm on the bike and understanding that I don't need to do that. You know, there's, there's a time and a place for that. And that's not necessarily every day. Um, and then also just kind of increasing time and zone and doing more work. Like Tim mentioned, I mean, I have been training for so long. So in order to create a stimulus that <laughs> creates an adaptation, it's it's more and more that overload side of things. So learning how to progress time and zone, um, both with SST stuff and VO2 stuff, just to increase capacity there has been huge. Um, and then from, from a recovery standpoint, you know, things that have changed over the years is, you know, obviously with age, your recovery becomes more and more important. Um, and the better you recover, the more load you can handle, you know, so it, it feeds off of itself. And so sleep, paying attention to my sleep, um, and doing little things behind the scenes with my lifestyle, um, to improve my sleep or maintain my sleep has been huge. I made big mistakes in 2017 and paid a big price in the second half of the year. So again, you know, your best lessons come from your biggest mistakes. Um, so that, that lesson for me has stuck with me the last couple of years and, and has helped me, I think, train better, um, moving, moving into this Olympic cycle. Do you want to, uh, go into what mistakes you made and, uh, and what you have changed to improve your sleep? 
Yeah, you know, I think so, you know, you always think you're invincible and you can do anything and everything you want to do. Um, and so for me, I had to acknowledge the fact that I needed to be in bed early or at a certain time every night, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, I could go to dinner with friends and one night and then the next night maybe go to church and then the next night do this. It was like, I had to be really careful with the amount of time that I spent outside um, of my recovery zone, which uh, for most people, that's not an issue. But if you're trying to make the Olympic team, you know, you have to be pretty single-mindedly focused. So, you know, I had to be real cognizant about not being out too late. So I had time at home essentially to unwind and to, to get away from the stimulus that would keep me awake. Um, and then like from being on electronics, for example, like coaching, writing emails, um, just being on my computer, you know, it's like an hour before going to bed, getting off of that, um, and being disciplined enough to do everything that needed to be done far enough in advance. So I could do that. Um, and then little tactics with, um, I think orange glasses at night and, just finding a rhythm, making sure I got my body in rhythm as best as I could um, with time down, time awake has really helped me increase the quality of my sleep in addition to the amount of time I've been sleeping. In terms of the stagnation that you you mentioned there, what do you think led to the stagnation? You you said that you had been doing the same thing for, for a long time. Was it just that you had been doing the same thing, but do you think it was also maybe even the wrong thing in the first place? And what did you do and uh, be, before uh, before changing things up and, and starting working with Tim? No, I think that from the stagnation point, I think, you know, I worked with the same coach for 15 years. So... It was really uh, the way he laid out the season and the structure of the season and the workouts we did. We often did the same workouts at the same time, you know, each year. And, you know, I would try to do them harder um, instead of, you know, us changing things up. I was I was trying to do them harder. You know, I I can't say whether it was right or wrong. I'm a very unique individual, and I think he figured out a way to – Help me. And I, I had great results. I won a world championship with him and won some really huge races um, and learned how to take care of my body. So, you know, I think, yeah, you can always look back and, and see things you could do differently. But there were also a lot of things we did right. But I think the primary thing was just, you know, 15 years of the same thing created a lot of stagnation. Um, additionally, you know, at that point, I had, let's see, starting really, I think 2009, 2010, I had a 14 month period where I, I was in three trauma centers resulting in surgeries, you know, it was crashes and injuries and the body, it just takes a toll on the body. So the energy needed to recover. Um, you know, I probably didn't, didn't do a very good job of addressing the whole body in my recovery. And that paid a price then when it comes to responding to training. Um, so I think it was probably a combination of those two things. Got it. Uh, you moved away a bit from the microphone there, by the way. So uh, I, if you can move closer for uh, the next question again, as it was before. Uh, but uh, Tim, do you have anything to, to add to this in terms of the, the development and uh, of Ember's training over the years? Yeah, you know, what I saw when I started working with her and, and this is a really tough pattern to change. So there was workout stagnation. And, and, and again, people hear that and they're like, well, that means Amber was doing bad workouts. No, not necessarily. Those were good workouts. The reality is your body, you know, gets efficient at adapting to specific stimuli. The, you can get too used to that stimuli um, pretty quickly, actually, quick, faster than most people think. Um, you know, when Amber came to me, the main thing to put it back in data terms, you know, if you're thinking in the, in the sense of a PMC, what would happen to Amber year in and year out? And this is a challenge of any professional cyclist because of the race season. Um, she would do a certain amount of, of base training, get to a certain chronic training load, and then would be basically at that same chronic training load from mid to late February, maybe, you know, through the race season. So you'd be very flat in your progression. Um, one of the things when you say that I changed 
was I just have a slightly different technique. I remember sitting down with Amber and uh, just talking about, well, what changes would we make? You know, I'm getting older in my career. What do we do? And I was saying, well, we're going to train more. Um, it's like, well, what do you mean we're going to train more? You know, and that's kind of part of it. But what I meant by more was I wanted to reshuffle the annual hours to be in a different schedule, more progression through that foundation phase, progressing to a, a significantly higher number in a CTL type of calculation, um, and then spending down that high fitness through the race phase and, and into peaking um, instead of allowing it to be kind of a flat line. Amber gave an ex- excellent example, though, how we could get – because she, she said it was her sleeping that hurt her in 2017 – 2017, we come out of Doha. We were on a high training cycle in Doha. That was an important year for Amber to reestablish coming back from her big crash and injuries as a world leader, world champion. So we were on a high training load and we both got maybe a little bit greedy. Uh, It is what it is. We trained back to a high training load in 2017. She smashed it at nationals and was unbelievable. And whereas in that was, you know, a very exciting time. In hindsight, we both could have seen the warning signs at that stage that 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 extended high CTL load was starting to have impact on her overall habits. Like, and Amber and I had this discussion a couple of days ago, it, was it chicken or an egg? She's talking about not sleeping. Uh, I would say that that extended high CTL training range that was lasting at that point, we were getting into the kind of 14 to 16 months range um, with some rest, don't get me wrong, but not enough. Uh, was taking its toll. By the time she got to Bergen, um, you know, she was right on the cusp of being overtrained, if not actually overtrained. And was she sleeping and and all those other? No. So was it the fact that we we had maybe over focused on that change and and peaking and growth and progression, as we had said? I would say, yeah, you know, so my learning lesson, because, you know, it's such a disappointing thing when your athlete goes and, you know, particularly on a stage like Worlds, when you're the defending champion and does not have a great day, you know, as a coach, you have to own that and live with it. It's as, it was as painful for me as it was for Amber, you know, and my takeaway from that was to then say, okay, what's the next goal? Uh, Olympics in Tokyo. Got it let's reduce, significantly reduce CTL and let's restart way further down and learn, take what we've learned here and build year over year more slowly to Tokyo. So I think, you know, the change has been, we, 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 we actually train some more, you know, not all that much more if you look at the actual hours, but in a, we raise to a higher CTL at select points in the season. We spend down, we need to, we don't want extended periods of flat CTL because that will, particularly if you match it with the same old workouts, that can pretty quickly lead to stagnation in a 40-plus athlete. This is a bit uh, tangential to the topic, I guess, but uh, for age group athletes that have a a set limit on how much they can train and they can't increase CTL or training hours year on year, uh, how do things change in terms of how they should plan their training, in your opinion, uh, compared to what Amber can do and... uh, and uh, distribute the training hours basically as she pleases. I, I, you know, and Amber said it, I, I think one of the mistakes that people make is they don't focus on time and zone. And it is, remember, TSS is a score of work you've done. It's not an indicator of anything else. Training stress score is just how much stress you're putting the body under. The actual driver of TSS is the the workout, right? The, the efforts, the energy you tend to expend or, or choose to expend. So for me, for time constrained athletes, it's so important that during that foundation phase, you adapt an expansion of time strategy. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're choosing, you're doing tempo work, right? Well, your first tempo effort is, let's say you start with 45 minutes because you've done some good riding around. You have a little bit of base, so you can do 45 minutes of tempo. What most athletes do is then they do 45 minutes of tempo Tuesday. They do 45 minutes of tempo Thursday and maybe come back and do 45 minutes on next Tuesday. And and then they do like three or four or five workouts of 45 minutes. And then it dawns on them, well, maybe I can go a little longer. Progression for the time crunched athlete is super important. 45 minutes for one. I never try to do more than two workouts at the same time and zone. And typically I just want it to be one. And the only reason I do two is if the athlete struggled to do 
the first time, meaning if I if, if somebody said, man, I almost died doing 45 minutes of tempo, I'd say, okay, repeat that one time. Then the next one's going to be 50. And if they can do that one, okay, the next one's 55. So you're always progressing time and zone. Same with sweet spot training. If you're I see the number of people, and this was a little bit of what I saw in Amber's history, and she actually said it. She'd always be doing something like, I'm not giving an actual example, two times 20. And then instead of building time in that 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 sub-threshold sweet spot, right, she would just try to go harder. And the reality is, again, for the time crunch athlete, do two times 20 for one to two workouts, and then make it two times 22, then two times 25, then you know, progress all the way out and their standards, a good time crunch athlete should be able to do at least an hour of SST in a workout. And then once you, and let's say you only have an hour and 15 minutes, once you can do three times 20 with five minute rest, keep tweaking the modality of the rest. Can you do three times 20 with four minutes of rest? You don't always need more power. I wouldn't be increasing. I would not be driving the increase in power as you expand time. Just accept the expansion of time. Now, your power will go up due to the increase in fitness. It will more naturally occur. But make the driver the expansion of that time and zone, not necessarily try and hit two, three, four, five more watts. Um, it will happen. And then when you kind of get to your maximum amount of time and you've done a couple of those two workouts at that kind of, hey, I've got, it, I've got it down now where I'm doing an hour of sweet spot. I'm only taking three minutes rest in between. Then raise power. Now, if you translate back to your point about your time crunch, you're actually everything I just said will keep you progressing training stress score for the similar type workouts. Because first you're using time in a higher zone to add a couple of TSS to each workout. Then once you get to a certain point, you're going to use intensity to add TSS to a certain workout. And that should be your progression. Got it. Uh, so let's uh, switch back again, switch uh, gears and uh, and talk about uh, Amber's training and uh, in your 40s, Amber, uh, how have things changed compared to what it was like 10 or 20 years ago when you were training? Uh, how have you needed to adapt training and, and racing? And if at all, uh, can you go into that? Yeah. So, you know, one thing for your younger athletes is just to remember the things you are doing now, you know, are going to pay consequences or pay dividends for you years later. So what I'm able to do now, I wouldn't be able to do if I hadn't been really good at attending to the details of my recovery, my nutrition, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago when I first got started. Um, now, I think some of the things that I've had to learn to do on the bike to keep me to keep me healthy um, is I've paid a lot more attention to body work and understanding how connected our bodies are. And how important that is to training. Um, so I've worked with, uh, his name is Lawrence Van Lingen, and he's in Laguna Beach. And he's been really good at helping untangle um, and unlayer all of the years and years of issues and inconsistencies that I've had. Um, cycling is one of those sports where you can continue to super compensate and layer problem over problem. So being able to unlayer those problems and then also learning how to prevent them moving forward. You know, I've just gotten so much better about taking care of myself um, and keeping my body in a op more optimal state to be able to absorb the training and adapt and respond. So I think in the later years, you know, that's probably one of the biggest things. Um, separately, like the nutrition side. So, I mean, I started on the bike back in the years when fat was bad. And so all you do is eat more carbohydrate, more sugar, more processed stuff. And, you know, when you're young and you're a rubber ball and you can bounce back, you know, that's one thing. But years and years and years of doing that um, came with a cost for me. And so I've had to learn how to eat better on the bike. Um, additionally, you know, I've gotten better off the bike too, which has helped but the on the bike nutrition and, and being able to fuel with more real type foods has been really important to just sustaining, I think, my general health, um, in addition to be, being able to fuel my workouts right. Um, and then I think, you know, just w working with Tim and loading and layering um, the work has been different and has been better. And as I've as I've done that right, you obviously build a foundation to do it 
better and do more of it the following year. Um, I think it was Coggin that said, the more you train, the more you can train. And so I think that's really been true with me over the years that I've just, I've continued to get wiser and smarter with how to train and, and doing that. And then I think the final piece of the puzzle, you know, is just mentally, um, you know, you, you learn as you get older, everything isn't as, you know, it's, it's not life or death. Oh my gosh, I failed in this workout. You have a better perspective of the, the whole big picture and you can be a little bit more at rest with the whole big picture of the work you're doing. Um, and you learn to forget things quicker. Um, and you also continue to just learn from the, from the things that don't go right. Again, like tuning your body, learning to listen to your body, all that comes with um, years and years of experience. Um, and mentally things get sharper and you, you, you start to understand things better. So a couple of follow-ups on that, keeping your body working and uh, preventing injuries and so on. In addition to the body work, you mentioned that you, you do work yourself. You have some sort of routine, I guess, just briefly. How often, how long durations of uh, like body or body maintenance or uh, prehab work do you do? Yeah, so probably every day before I go out for a ride, I'll spend, you know, it might only be five minutes, but it can be up to 20 minutes of really just, I'll start with breathing, just breathing and twisting and making sure I'm, I'm moving oxygen and expelling CO2 um, and, and just turning on the parasympathetic as much as I can. And then making sure the other thing I'll do in that time is I want my hips to be flat. So my, my hips will tend to rotate forward. And when they do, then it impacts my glute activation. And so in my pre-ride mobility, you know, I'm paying attention to my hips and where they are. Are they flat? Are they rotated forward? And if they're flat, then what I, what I go through doesn't take very much time. But if they're a bit more rotated, then obviously something is pulling and figuring out where that's coming from. Is that my shoulders, you know, are my shoulders not activated? Are they tight? Do I need to make my neck longer? Is it coming from my adductors being too tight, you know, or are my quads pulling? So it's just then kind of going through a series of movements, um, probably movements more than stretching, static stretching, but more um, moving and uh, actively trying to stretch and activate all at the same time, you know, so that's, that's maybe five to 20 minutes. Um, and then after, after my rides, um, it's really, whether it's directly after or in the evening, it's just spending time with a tennis ball, um, and using that as a trigger point on different areas that I feel might be tight or, you know, simply rubbing the fascia, um, in the areas that contribute to, my problematic um, patterns. I think everybody ha probably has patterns of where they typically get too tight and that, that, that create the issue. So I just, I focus on just those areas that I've learned from working with somebody smarter than me um, are areas that I need to address. And in terms of the nutrition, the changes you made on and off the bike, can you go into a bit more detail on that as well? Yeah. So like I said, in the beginning, all I did... It, did on the bike was eat gels. So, you know, quick energy, carbohydrate. And I mean, I would use, if I think back, I mean, I, I would do five hour long run rides and eat eight, nine gels on the ride. And then you think about how many gels I was eating on Tuesday and Thursday, and then on the weekend rides, you know, and then it's like you get home and you got to have your carbohydrates to recover. So it was just a ton of sugar. So I think my body got really carb dependent. So in the interim phase in 2013, it was really just trying to get my body to remember how to use fat. Um, and then on the bike, being able to kind of blend better uh, the fat utilization with the carb utilization. Um, so now when I fuel on the bike, I'm using, I'm you know, I keep my hydration in the bottle and my, my energy, my calories in my pocket. So I, I use more of an electrolyte blend in the bottle. Um, and then in my pocket, I like something like a bonk breaker bar where the, um, 
you know, you have a mix of carbs, a little bit of protein and a little bit of fat in there that kind of helps slow down the release of energy. So I am able to digest that on the bike and I've learned how to digest that on the bike. Um, in choosing to fuel that way, though, I have to be really on top of things. You know, if you get behind, it's a lot harder to catch back up. So learning the cues my body gives me, um, the hydration cues versus the the food cues. Um, I, you know, I've gotten better at reading those and then taking taking action quicker. And uh, Tim, do you have anything to add to this topic on how training changes uh, in Amber's 40s versus for a younger athlete or a younger Amber? Yeah, you know, I, I would just add a little bit of color highlight in the sense. I mean, if you listen to what she's saying, right, you can see that Amber is disciplined detailed and has a process, right? Part of what makes her such an amazing athlete and, and now what makes her, you know, a, an, an amazing mature athlete as she kind of gets into this phase of training and this phase of performance where, you know, it, 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 it's like it's uncharted water, right? You go back to that fact at 45 or years old, you know, and driving for the Olympics to compete in the Olympics at 40, I'm sorry, 44 years old and driving to compete in the Olympics at 45, we don't have a roadmap. I mean, I can't go and look at a bunch of physiological studies and say, oh, here's a bunch of 45-year-old elite athletes performing at an elite level. And if you do this, here's what's going to happen. If they eat that, here's what's going to happen. Um, they're just not out there. So part of what are, and what's been so great for me to be involved with, you know, working with Amber is we've been – cognitive and we've been a team in creating that discipline you know and it really is it's four legs of a stool right you have nutrition sleep body work and training so physio you know that type when i say body work um the reality is if you are doing those right right amber does all those with an amazing discipline she is a true professional athlete who lives every day like a professional athlete. She has the discipline to do all that, but she's had that for a while. And that's what's now not only the driver of why she's performing at an elite level, it also has enabled her to perform at an elite level at this age. The thing that I would add, you know, so for younger riders to begin to develop, I work with other young professionals who are just, you know, still racing at the world tour, but maybe don't have all those disciplines. And I work because of my time with Amber. That's an excellent example. It makes me work harder with those younger athletes to <laughs> shape those discipline and habits. The one thing that she said, though, I think that's super important. Take that stool, those four legs, right? And they sit on a floor called stress. And one of the things I think the true pros do really well is they learn to deal with overarching stress, whether that's life stress, performance stress, event stress, um, the ability to, you know, accept that, absorb it and get over it is also a big impact on training. Um, we can, whether we're a 22 year old young pro, a 35 year everyday Joe doing the local event, the reduction of life and overall stress um, has a massive impact on how that stool functions. So, you know, it's a great underlying tip. What she said, she's really learned to deal with it. So many pro athletes um, live or die by every single performance. I've worked with athletes in the past who can't even do training races because if they don't do well, the stress lasts for three weeks and it's not worth doing a training race um, because their, their, their anxiety about the performance, the stress is such a barrier. So I think you, there was a lot of great messages in there for the everyday rider, for the young rider and for the mature elite rider. Yeah. I think the last part about the, the stress and uh, like the, the desire to always perform at peak level, that's uh, probably almost more, uh, more common in, in the amateur riders i, I would say that uh, that's uh, something that's very pre prevalent so a good good take-home message there if we continue with you tim uh, what about uh, the, the, is are there any differences in how you coach amber uh, being a woman compared to how you would uh, coach uh, male elite athletes yeah that's a great question it really is because to be honest with you i get it all the time about five years ago um i started coaching i 
uh, women professional cyclists only. Um, the reality is I've always felt, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of women cycling. They don't have access to the, qu- the quality of coaching that the men's world tour riders do because they don't have the salary. They can't afford it. Um, so it's been a, a great learning and lesson and journey about the differences. It's kind of funny. One of the overarching topics, and I got to give credit to Scott Moniger. He, uh, he coined this phrase, uh, men are stronger, women are tougher. Um, it's actually been a great evolution of working and, and spending all you know my coaching time with women cyclists because I truly see that. Their, their discipline and approach, the toughness in getting things done, um, I, I think is one of the changes. And as a coach, you have to be able to adapt to that and use it as a, as a benefit and as a strength for the athlete and, and know when to stop it from being a limit or a weakness, right? But to really get into the specific training, you know, with all good training, it really comes down to demands of the event and ability of the rider. You always have to be thinking about those two things. So when you think about overarching training, one of the big differences between men and women at the professional level um, is the length of season intensity and length of racing. So at the high level, right, uh, women are not racing quite as much as men. Um, there's more events and, and more more ability to participate. And the events aren't as long, and we tend not to have things like grand tours and stuff like that at that level, which we certainly should for women, But uh, and we're continuing to make progress in that, but not, not something that you see yet. So – in that, guys, talking at the professional level, men need to train, particularly world tour men need to train towards higher CTL than women uh, have the requirement to train to. Not that they couldn't train to that level. It's just the event demands aren't high enough to require a super high CTL like like a grand tour would require. So I think one of the overarching differences at the professional level is that they don't need to train quite as much. They don't need to raise that CTL as high. Um now, when you get into the overarching and you talk about the everyday riders, you know what? I would generally stand with there is no difference. And I think one of the things that cycling has done a poor job of, and it needs to change the way it approaches, and I, I might take some heat for this, but I'll take it. Um, we need to stop segmenting women out as different. Um, we have women camps and women training and women this and that. Women are, are tougher than the guys, and they can handle training just as well. So I think my first step, my first answer is I don't train them different. The reality is I train the individual, whether that's a male or a female, and I'm going to individualize training for their specific needs. Every individual then is different. So there is uniqueness to each person. Each person, you know, the physiological response to exercise stimuli has a unique pattern. You as a coach simply have to find that pattern, male or female. But I would also say, to be fair, there are some physiological differences that you need to pay attention to. Um, but even then, I don't think it's that big. It's funny. There's a high variance here, and everything. the science here isn't strong. It's out there, but it's not strong. Um, women actually have a better response in, at certain hormonal levels. HGH, things like that, will respond better to higher volume training. So you might use a little more volume in women's training versus male's training to get, and you might find a better response, I should say, to higher volume endurance style training from women than men. But there's no absolute there. I mean, there's some science that proves it, but you're much better off finding out the individual answer. Women tend to deal with lactate a little bit better. There's some science that says that and actually will get a better response. It's been demonstrated that women deal with hydrogen or 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 hydrogen or, or or acidity at the muscular level that's caused by that spinoff of hydrogen. Um, so you have a little bit more ability to do lactate work and get some better improvements or th- let's call it lactate threshold, even though we're talking about a broad array of what's happening with lactate um, and improve. So you might get a little better result doing a little more thresholdy kind of work with women. But at the end of the day, um, the individual demand way out trumps the gender demand. Focus on the individual athlete, you know, build on their strengths, limit their weaknesses, understand the demands of the event that you're training for and drive towards that. And that'll get you the best results. Got it. So uh, we're starting to get to the end of uh, my little questions here. But uh, one thing that I do want to get into here, and we've touched on some of them probably already along the course of of this interview, but uh, 
Amber, are there any particular lessons learned from the past that uh, that you want to share that uh, are now helping you be competitive and uh, maximize the results from your training? Yeah, I mean, we talked about the nu- nutrition and the taking care of the body side of things already. Um, I would add, you know, from the competitive side of things, I over the years, I've made a ton of mistakes within the racing. But those mistakes have given me a much better ability to be able to read races and understand races. So those mistakes have made me tactically very wise. Uh, So at this age that I am now being able to read races and see what is happening, you know, has been huge. Um, So, you know, I would encourage people not to be afraid to get out there and race and make mistakes because you are going to learn a ton that you're going to be able to put to use moving forward. Um, From the training side, I think saying it most simply would probably be just the idea of how important it is to create an adaptive signal versus, you know, putting myself into survival mode. I think the athletes that tend to move towards endurance sports are highly motivated and they're intrinsically motivated and doing work is not a problem, but (laughs) resting or doing the right kind of work becomes a problem. And so just understanding um, better how to create an adaptive response versus crushing myself and putting myself into non-functional zone or non-functional overreaching zone has been really, really critical to be able to maximize my training in recent years. And Tim can probably expand on some of that. Yeah, go ahead, Tim, if you have anything to add. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. One of the things that, that, that I, you know, have learned and really have learned this well from working with Amber is, you know, we've evolved off maybe the traditional training, you know, you say training plan, right? What's, what's Amber Neiman's training plan. I get that question all the time. Um, You know, and when you say training plan, right, you see a calendar with months and and workouts and every days. Um, we really don't have that. It's going to sound odd. We don't have that formalized of a plan. Don't get me wrong. We have a calendar with workouts and those workouts happen in phases, right? But we actually have a training strategy. We're trying to accomplish things in each, each micro cycle. It depends on how you define the words, but each small part, each step within our greater training strategy. And we accomplish that. We move on. If we don't, we analyze why we didn't and maybe tweak and and figure out what we needed to do. And all of that though is, uh, it's responsive. It's adaptive to Amber's fatigue management. So here's a classic example, right? We might have a training plan and the classic training plan approach is we're going to do three weeks on and one week rest, right? That's probably the most common um, rhythm of training that you'll see out there. Um, We loosely use that. But when, if Amber, you know, begins to show signs of fatigue two and a half weeks in, two weeks in, we rest, if Amber gets to three weeks, which has happened in even this year, it happened to us, I think one or two cycles and she still had good training in her. We don't. So, you know, one of the things that, that we, and it's only been because the quality of Amber's communications, she said this earlier about, she just, she writes amazingly good notes. She understands her body well and describes it well. Um, so I can read her notes and quantify very quickly. I can take the, 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 qualified data and quantify it like one, two, or three, you know, good, uh, neutral and bad. Right. And really quickly figure out how she's feeling just based on the communication. She's very consistent in her languaging and her description, which really helps. So that drives our strategy. Um, when I'm looking at strategy and when we need to shift, uh, you know, uh, off plan and is result, you know, numbers. So power results, sleep hours and her notes. It's those three. And I read them every, I look at that, those three points every day. Um, Not like what was exactly this interval and this and that. I look at that at times, not every day, but the overarching, put those combination together and that drives. So we stay flexible and we adapt to that strategy. And that probably has been one of the key lessons. And I could tell you as a coach, you know, working with somebody like Amber always challenges you. So you get better. I've been able to apply that same strategy to my other athletes more and more. They have to be as good at the communication side, right? And understanding, but I've been able to apply that, that uh, a more flexible approach to, to other athletes with success. So it's been a great learning lesson for me. Great. And uh, Amber, 
Do you have any final main take-home messages from this discussion for amateur listeners in particular that uh, they can learn from what we have been discussing that would still apply to an amateur with a more more tight schedule with family and jobs and things like that? Yeah, I think a couple. I mean, obviously with my age, it's hopefully a, a big encouragement. I think it, you're never too young to dream and you're never too old to dream or you you're never have too much time or too little time. You know, it's, it's a matter of deciding you want to try to do something and getting after it. Um, and then just remembering too, that achieving any goal is going to be hard. I mean, we've been talking about the Olympic cycle and that's four years long. And we've been talking about the year within, you know, the last year within that four year period, but it just, it's hard. It takes time. It takes work. Um, and, and it's never a straight line. I, I think a lot of times we want things to be easy and linear, um, go from point A to point B in a straight line. And that rarely does that happen. Um, just to remember that you, you will have setbacks and, you know, you just want to be trending forward. And I like to say hard is not impossible. Um, and when you embrace your process and you start paying attention to the, the small details, um, the daily things you can do, it sets you on a path towards achieving those goals. Um, and, and generally, I mean, it's going to be a blend of everything. Tim said, you know, it's, there's four legs to the stool kind of idea and it's, it's blending all of it. It's blending the science, it's blending the art, the recovery. Um, and you know, within that too, I would, I would add when you have a really clear why, um, that really helps motivate you. And it also helps guide your decision-making as you try to prioritize your time and, and how to do things. Perfect. And the, the final part of this interview is uh, the rapid fire question segment where we just uh, have a, a very short and uh, sharp questions and answers. And uh, Tim has obviously answered these before. So these are for you, Amber. And the first one is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to endurance sports? Oh my gosh. I've, I don't know. Um, I jump around too much. Um, I'm too topic oriented um, to really give you a good answer on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Uh, I think being intentional about the details of each day, um, including the details within your workout or whatever it is on your plate that you want to achieve that day. And finally, what do you wish you had known or done differently at some point in your career? Okay, since I didn't answer the first one, I'm going to add a couple here. Um, I <laughs> wish enough. I paid more attention. <laughs> I wish I paid more attention to skills, like the on-the-bike skills. We always think about training our engine, but we forget the, the other things that are important to competition. So I wish I paid more attention to just the foundational um, basics of skills. Um, if I could go back in time, I wish I feel differently on the bike. I think it would have changed up the results in some bigger races, um, where I would have been stronger at the end. Um, and then I think the other uh, last one would be just, I now understand how connected the body is and how important it is to respect it and take care of it. Um, you know, I, I'd crash and shatter a collarbone and jump on the bike the next day because my legs worked and never took care of my shoulders, you know, so it's all connected and it all ultimately will impact your performance, whether it's that day or whether it's in two years time. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, both to Amber and to Tim. This has been really, really fun and, uh, and I've learned a lot and uh, I've never done an episode like this with, uh, with the athlete and the coach. And, uh, but I can see myself doing many more of this. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Tim suggesting this and us doing this, because I, I think that this was very, very interesting. And I'm, I'm hoping that, and I'm, I think that the listeners will, will agree that this was very useful. So thanks to both of you. Thanks. Thank you. I really hope that you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. As I mentioned there at the end, uh, it's the first time I've interviewed an athlete and a coach and generally as you know i have really not uh, i have focused on or niched down to not into professional athletes because i think that most other podcasts already do that especially the triathlon space whereas very few podcasts actually interview coaches and industry experts so that's what i've decided to focus on but i think in this way actually interviewing both the athlete and the coach it was really fun i really enjoyed it and i hope that you did too and found it useful 
I'll be very happy. Uh, I'm always happy to receive feedback, but in particular for this episode and this type of format, is this something you want to hear more about then, or hear more of these types of episodes with an athlete and a coach? Let me know because I'd be quite keen on doing more if there is an interest from the listeners, if you found that it was valuable. So definitely looking forward to hearing from you. My email is michael at scientifictriathlon.com and it's michael with a K. We'll, of course, link in the episode, in the show notes on that triathlon show.com and in the episode description to uh, the things that we maybe did not mention because I forgot to ask where we can follow Amber. But we'll have her Instagram in the show notes. You can just search Amber Nieben and other social media. Her website is nebenpx4.com. And you, c- you can find info about her athletic career as well as her coaching and other services there. So check that out, nebenpx4.com. And we'll, of course, have links to the previous uh, interviews I've done with Tim Cusick, which were in episodes 199 and 72 as well. Now, one final house cleaning item. Yesterday, by the time of this recording, yesterday was the 16th of October, uh, that Strathlon show reached a million downloads, which is uh, a huge milestone. I'm super happy and pumped to have reached that. So uh, I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who has helped that a milestone become reality and this includes of course our sponsors current and past uh, so currently of course precision hydration and roca uh, thank you to Kerry, our audio editor who has been doing the audio editing of the show for just over two years uh, by the time of this recording since episode 74 i believe and big thanks as well to samantha who does uh, all the work with the show notes since i believe uh, march 2018 which uh, around episode 108 and uh, of course a massive thank you to all of you in the audience uh, the engagement level the feedback and the suggestions and ideas it's all absolutely amazing uh, so please keep it up i'm really really appreciative of it and now I just hope that reaching 2 million downloads will take slightly less time than 2 years and 8 months and slightly less effort than the first million did because it was a lot of blood, sweat and tears going into this first million. Uh, but it was all very much worth it and I enjoy the, doing the podcast probably more than I've ever done at this point. So there's uh, no sign of stopping. Big thanks, finally, to our sponsors. I already mentioned them. Precision Hydration. You can find them on precisionhydration.com. Get a free hydration plan and try your first box or tube of Electrolyte product for free with the promo code. That triathlon show, all one word, all caps. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Go and check out their wetsuits, dry suits, swim skins, goggles, and high-performance eyewear and get 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlons.